Today, uh, just a, a wonderful day. Thank the Lord that we can be together. We prayed the rain away again. Amen. Come on. And we just continue to do that. I think it's already forecasting for rain next week, but hang around. We live in Virginia. Anything can change. And pray it away again. Amen. I want Sylvia to just lead us in prayer this morning. And uh, we have our prayer list here that we're praying for, several in the hospital, uh, recovering from surgeries. And uh, we have the uh, appeal to heaven flag out here today. Uh, we feel like uh, we're just praying for our nation and wish we'd had it out here from the very first time. But we thought to have it out here. And uh, so we are appealing to heaven. Let me say something. Some of you, I noticed your... Uh, headlights are on unless your car is running you need to uh make sure that your headlights are not on we don't want any dead batteries again today we're also having to learn that in the process of this through the week so we've had a couple of dead batteries uh each each week so check and make sure your headlights aren't on i realize some of you have daytime running lights and uh if anything's operating on your car they're automatically on but just we don't want you to have a dead battery so just uh, pay attention to that sylvia come and pray for us today. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for sunshine. Lord, we thank you that your presence is on this property and you're with us. We thank you, Lord, that you are going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we could think or ask. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing in this nation. And we call our nation back to you. We call our state back to you, and we declare that this virus is dried up off of this nation and off this people. And, Father, we believe you that out of all of this, there's going to come a great revival. And we speak blessings over everyone that's here. Father, anyone that's sick, we believe your healing power to go into their car and make them well. Father, we declare that the people of WOW are blessed that we are well and we are financially blessed and wow will be a beacon of hope to everyone that comes in. We thank you for this in your name. Amen. Amen. Just a, a few uh, newer announcements for you. Well, this one's not so new. Our ushers are going to come. And uh, if you need a giving envelope, and perchance, if you are a guest here for the first time today, we want to welcome you. It seems so odd doing this outside, but this is the way we have to do it. So our ushers are coming, those in the vest, and uh, they have a, a giving envelope, and they also have a response uh, welcome card. So if you are a guest today for the first time, take one of the cards and fill it out, or... Thank you, Darren Pittman. Electronically on your phone or your media device today, uh, when you go on the website or the app, there is a response welcome card there, and you can fill that out right there on your media device and hit submit, and we'll get it that way too. So turn your flashers on, your emergency flashers on, if you need an envelope or you need one of the guest cards, and our ushers will serve you. So turn your flashers on and leave them on until you're served. Kind of like going to Sonic Burger or something, isn't it? <laughs> Give them a minute to serve you doing that. Thank you, ushers, for... They're out in the sunshine. You guys are in the sunshine. It's cool up here today. A nice 36 degrees. I saw it about 5-something this morning, but going to warm up. Warmer days are coming, but <laughs> hopefully we'll be back inside enjoying that. I don't know. We'll see. We will see. The way that we uh, give you an opportunity to both give your envelope back in or the uh, guest registration is when you leave today at our three exits, there'll be ushers there with an orange basket, and you can put your uh, envelope you're giving in there or your card in there, or again, you can fill out the electronic version of the card. Also, the card or the electronic version, not only is it a guest registration, for you, but also if the Lord touches you in a way today, or you have the Lord saves you or heals you or touches you, you can also, the bottom part of that electronic version, it's a response thing, and you can record 
how God touched you today and give us your name and all that. And then just make sure you hit submit button. It comes to us and we will respond to you. This is a way that you can communicate with us. We can communicate with you. And so thank you for doing that. So our worship team's coming. Uh, so let's worship the Lord this morning. Come on, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Bless his name. He's good to us. Hallelujah. Come on, let's bless the Lord this morning. You know, sometimes during the middle of this pandemic, we get worried, we get stressed out. But I want you to know if you'll lift up a hallelujah, and if you lift up a praise, God's peace will come upon you. His presence will fill you. Come on, let's raise a hallelujah this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. We lift up a hallelujah to you. You are worthy. You are holy. There's no God like you. You reign forever. You are the one true living God. We bless you. We honor you. We worship you. We crown you with praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of all the glory, Lord. All the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. Come on, everybody. You are one.
Him right now. Just give Him glory. Worship Him. We worship you. We give you a wave offering, God. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Lift him up this morning. Bye. 
you, Lord, that you're keeping us, Lord, through all of this, Lord. Not just the virus, but, oh, God, all of the other emotions that we're going through and the things that we're going through in this nation and the world, Father. We know that, Lord Jesus, your very words that you spoke in Matthew and Mark and Luke and the other gospel writers picked up in the epistles, Paul and Peter, James and the others. But Lord Jesus, we are in those last days. We really are. We really are. Sometimes, Lord, we have to pinch ourselves or stop and just make ourselves think about it that we are in the last days. And it's hard to comprehend that we probably, most likely, are the very generation that's going to be here at your return. And we ask you, Father, search our hearts. Search our hearts, O oh God, as your people, the church the bride of Christ, the body of Christ that awaits your return. We're hungry, Lord, for you to return. We're hungry, Lord, for your presence. We're hungry, O oh God. We want to see our loved ones one to Jesus. Amen? We want to see our friends. We want to see those, O oh God, that we know that are around us neighbors, even around this community, Lord, under the shadow of this very property that, Lord, don't know you, Lord. They're all down these streets. They're all down these community, this, this neighborhood and these sections, Lord. God, even the new section, oh God, over at Huntington. Father, we pray. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus for the Holy Spirit to bring realization and revelation and understanding to them of your love. We pray that, Lord, that we would be more effective witnesses, God. Not afraid, not ashamed to declare your name, Father. We bless you today, God. Lord, we pray that, Lord, your word that you put in my heart, I ask you, Holy Spirit, especially for the help that only you can give, that, Lord, I don't speak my mind, I don't speak my will, I don't speak my opinion, but, God, I speak what's on your heart to your people here this morning, Father. To those, oh God, that are listening live streaming, to those in this parking lot, to those, O oh God, that will hear this archive message at another time. I pray, Lord, give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to your people, Father, today. We bow our hearts before you now. It's in Jesus' name, Lord, we worship you and bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen and amen. I felt after prayer and all week long, I struggled with this. I prayed. I said, Lord, I, I know I've, we, were on a, we were on a series called Pursuing God's Blessings Through the Beatitudes. And I know Resurrection Sunday and Palm Sunday kind of was interjected there. And praise the Lord for that. But yet I said, Lord, am I supposed to go back to this series on the Beatitudes? And as I read it and as I read through my notes and as I read the actual Bible, that when we look at the Beatitudes, this is the character of Jesus himself. And this is what the character that, you, that Jesus said you and I, as his people, were supposed to demonstrate with our Christian following Christ lifestyle. So in saying that, and, 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 and in all connection and parallel with what the prophetic voices are saying to us in this time from Dutch Sheets to Jeremiah Johnson to uh, Tracy Cook and Perry Stone. And I could go on and on and on rattling off names, but many of them and all of them are giving us the same message in the hour that we're in today. That uh, not only a, a time of surviving COVID-19 and, and being healthy and being well, but realizing the day and the hour that we're living in, things in this world, the whole scenario of this world, it's changing. It's not like it used to be. And again, we could go back and try to compare it with 9-11. The world changed. But this is even more serious than 9-11. My prayer has been that, God, that it won't just last a week, that people won't be afraid or scared just for a week. But, Lord, this will bring a permanent time of repentance and change and, and turning back to you, God. And I hope that's your prayer, too. I, I feel like... 
I feel like that's the way that we should pray for us ourselves. I don't want to be the same. I don't need to be the same. God wants me to change. God wants me to draw nearer to Him, and I believe that same for you too. So in, in saying that and in believing that, I felt like the Lord would have me to go back to the message of pursuing God through the Beatitudes, and yet I've been up early this morning, and, and I, I don't know what to do sometimes with all this rest time that we have at home now, although we do keep office hours here, but still there, there's time on our hands that we didn't have before, and been trying to read and pray more and just sense what the Holy Spirit's saying, doing for me personally, for us together co collectively, corporately as a church. And today, I, I'm not real good at naming messages, but if I were to name this today, I would call it, and you can find these notes on the internet too, under the app or the website, under the, uh, under the notes section, with all of its glorious mistakes and misspells and typos, you can find it there. But today we're talking about taking ownership or taking responsibility. And under the power of the uh, spiritual morning, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus, Jesus, not another, not another prophet, not a disciple, not a follower, but Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach himself said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And several weeks back, uh, when we began this series, I spoke of the elements of spiritual mourning, and we didn't quite finish them. And in dealing with this epidemi epidemic that we're dealing with and focusing on what the Lord is saying to us through this time, looking at the definition of spiritual mourning, and I talked about there were several types of mourning, natural mourning for the loss of a loved one or a friend, and then, but the real mourning that Jesus was talking about, spiritual mourning, was mourning before God, being sorrowful before God over our personal sins. That's one element. Or the sins of our nation, which certainly we do need to be repenting. Second Chronicles 7, 14. That's why today I felt, Sylvia and I were talking and just in prayer felt like bringing the flag out, appeal to heaven. And many of you know the story about that. I don't really want to get into the full-length story, but this is a flag that George Washington commissioned to be made and flew over the Continental Army troops. They were outnumbered, outgunned, didn't have the medicine, didn't have the uniforms, didn't have anything that the British soldiers had against them. And he realized if we're going to gain our freedom from this tyranny, we're going to have to make an appeal to heaven. And that's exactly what this flag represented. And again, I invite you to go to DutchSheets.org, his website, and find the podcast, which is audio only podcast, and find the podcast that says Cherry Blossoms, Washington, D.C., and Valley Forge. You'll hear a brief story about the flag, but not just that but how God is moving in our nation today. Very encouraging message. Some of the prophetic messages are on the scary side or on the side of alarming us, and we, need, we do need to be alarmed. We do need to be shook up in our, the way the world is, the way our country is. We need that, but we need it to be a lasting, life-changing, convicting of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So as we define spiritual mourning as Jesus defined it, which I think goes along in lines of what I've just said to you about our nation, our individual life, and then our nation repenting before God, uh, it's not, this thing's not just a, a, matter, a matter of survival against the coronavirus. God's, I, as I've said, I don't think God sent it. I don't think God created it, but I think God would want to use this globally to wake the world up, to show us how fragile life is, how broken our world is, and how our material possessions don't meet our needs like we thought they would or could or should. So when we look at the definition of spiritual mourning, it's a heartfelt sorrow, a heartfelt sorrow over specific 
sins. Not sin in general. Oh, God, I messed up. Oh, God, I did this. Arising from humility that offers and gives hope. Thank God. God, when God convicts us, He always gives us hope. His end is that we have hope in Him. Not just conviction, not just condemnation, but that we have hope. He convicts us. He deals with us when we miss it, when we sin, when we fail, in order to bring us to the hope that we have in Jesus. I want to say more about that later. This is not a condemning message. Jesus did not preach to condemn us, and I don't want to preach in that way either today. But it's a heartfelt sorrow or specific sins and arises from humility, gives hope that leads you and I to forsake our sins and leave them at the cross. And we said in just a real brief we said spiritual mourning, it names particular sins. Not a mistake, not a slip, not an accident. Oh, that's just the way my family is. We have to call the sin in our heart, in our life, and in this nation. You've got to call it what it really is. It's a sin. It's an abomination. It's a violation against God or even another person. And the truth about this is you cannot really be free in Jesus until you accept your responsibility and own up to your failure to be able to do what the Lord wants you to do, which goes back to the first of the Beatitudes that Jesus said, it's being poor in spirit, realizing you don't have in yourself and myself what it takes to measure up to God's standard. And then we said the second spiritual morning, it would involve heartfelt sorrow. There is a difference between just admitting that you've sinned and being repentant from the heart. There's a difference. You can just say, oh yeah, I know I've sinned. I know I'm not perfect. I know and this is the way my family is. Well, that's just admitting to it. That's just an intellectual assent or agreement to it. But spiritual mourning involves repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of action that comes from the heart. And again, I said, I use a story, the example of King Saul back in 1 Samuel when he disobeyed the prophetic word to kill Agag, the king, to kill all the animals, don't bring anybody back alive. He, he thought him and his men, or especially King Saul, thought it'd be a good thing. He said, man, these are choice sheep, and I spared the king in order to parade him before all of Israel and show what a great king I was and a great warrior and triumphant I was. And he thought it was going to be great, and Samuel confronted him. And says, what is this I'm hearing in my ears? The lowing of the oxen and the sheep. And Samuel, King Saul made an excuse. He appeared to genuinely repent. But then he asked Samuel, Samuel, go back with me before the people and, and show them that, hey, it's all okay. He really wasn't repentant. His true intention was on damage control. His true motivation was saving his reputation not on having a sorrow that would lead him to repentance. So, how do you cultivate a heartfelt sorrow? We need to know how. It's not just saying words. It's having a heart change. And, and that heart change brings victory over our sins. I want to be victorious over my sins. Jesus died, gave his very life shed his blood, left heaven, so that you and I could not just be forgiven, but have victory over the power of sin. Amen. So we have to realize, what does sin cost yourself? Well, it costs, it costs you personally when you don't repent from your sins. It costs you from being hindered to be effectively used and fulfill the purpose and the destiny that God has for your life. Because God can't bless you when you're living in disobedience to him. It's just that simple. And sin dulls our worship and our relationship to the Lord, and it keeps us at a distance from the Lord. Oh, we can say, well, I love the Lord, and He knows my heart, and all those catchy little sayings we have. But that's true. The Lord really does know your heart. He knows that maybe there is some secret hidden sin there that you're not willing to let go of. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then we have to realize, what does sin cost others? When you and I cling to our sins and we refuse to totally, honestly, from heartfelt repentance, leave our sin, what it costs you is it makes you hard to live with.
hard to live with by your spouse, your family, or anybody else around you. And another element of it, what does it cost you? Even if they never find out of your secret sin or pet sin, you're participating in not allowing the Lord to work a heartfelt repentance in your life and really being free from it. What that does, you participating in that sin, and you say, well, nobody knows, and it's no big deal, and I'm not hurting anybody else. Yes, you are. You're not only hurting yourself, you are robbing others of what they could benefit from and receive from you if you were totally walking with the Lord and you were the blessing and the light and the salt that God intended for you to be. Hallelujah. And then thirdly, what does, it, what do, what does our unrepentant sin without heartfelt sorrow, what is it costing Jesus? My Lord, we just looked at that the last two weeks, Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. Jesus did not hang on the cross and die for sins in general. But he died for specific sins that have names attached to it, dates attached to it of when it happened, and faces to which sin was committed against. Jesus suffered for the sin that you and I should be mourning over. And he, and he endured the punishment for that sin that belongs to you and I. It cost Jesus something to die for your sins. Godly sorrow does lead to repentance, and repentance leads to a life of God in Jesus Christ. Now, third, spiritual mourning, it arises from humility. Spiritual mourning, it's a heartfelt sorrow over sins that arises from humility, which gives hope. I'll stop there, and we'll use the rest of the definition later. Here's the major challenge that you and I face in spiritual mourning. Here it is. You ready for it? The major challenge that you and I face in order to really let the Holy Spirit bring us to that place of spiritual mourning in our life, it is the difficulty in grieving over the sins that you and I have enjoyed. Come on. In Hebrews 11, 25, it talks about Moses. It says, Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses made a choice. I'm not staying in Egypt. I'm not going to be an Egyptian. I'm siding with the people of God to be who God wants us to be. But he says that in that statement, he, did, he made that choice rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, we all know this is true. The enjoyment of sin, sin's pleasure, it is available. And it does have a season. But it doesn't last. And it always demands from you more than the enjoyment that you get from it. The pleasure. The pleasure of sin always. The pleasure of sin always leaves regret. There is... A, some sense of comfort and pleasure in sin that always keeps us coming back to it because it's a place of comfort. But Jesus wants to set us free from that. And how do you come to that place where heartfelt sorrow over sin that has had an attraction on us for a long time? It's called a, a bondage or a, 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 a stronghold in our life. Well, it's what Jesus said in the first beatitude. The first one of them. We have to become poor in spirit. We have to admit. You see, what, what disturbs me about all of this coronavirus, I'm thankful that we live in a country, a nation, that I think they're doing everything that they can discover and find out how to help us, how to cure us, how to keep us healthy, how to keep the economy going, how, how to help us. I, I believe that. Uh, they're discovering things every day. And so it's fluid, as they call it. It changes. And I'm thankful for that. But what disturbs me about this, has there really been enough turning to the Lord? Has there really been enough turning to the Lord even on our part as God's people that we are willing to, that we're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us personally? You see, what's in most of our mind, maybe not everybody here today, but 
what's definitely in most of America's mind and the world's mind is, when are we going to return back to normal? When are we going to be released to go to the beaches is what they're wondering in Florida and California. When are we going to be able to go back to the stores? When am I going to be able to go back to the beauty shop and have my hair done and my nails done and my pedicure? When are we going to be able to go to the bank? And when are we able to go to the store and find everything that we want again? When are we going to have our freedoms restored and returned to it? That's what's on most people's mind. When are we going to return to normal life, our comfortable life that we once had? I'm not trying to condemn anybody today, but I think God's trying to use this time to wake this world up. And cause us to realize that our comforts, he's not interested in our comforts. He's interested in our character. He's interested in our following the Lord. He's interested in us knowing the Lord. He's interested in us trying to in us stop playing the games. He's interested in us really, as us Christians, believers, judgment begins first at the house of God. And that's why I believe this message of the Beatitudes Jesus preached, it's definitely in line of what we're going through right now. If you and I don't get it right with God, the world's never going to see Jesus. So we must become first poor in spirit and then allow the Holy Spirit to take us to that place of spiritual mourning over our personal, hidden, secret areas of our life. That we've not been willing to give up and let go to God. Seeing our poverty before God in spirit, that's the starting place. And we've got to go there. It's painful. I admit it's painful. None of us enjoy it when God, the Holy Spirit, puts the finger on an area of our life. Believe me. March, I said, March is mouth months. It's like everything I said that came out of my mouth, I said it wrong. And I was having to repent. And, and, and I said, Lord, help me. Catch me in my mind before I let it come out of my mouth. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I said, Lord, evidently I've got some heart issues about some people or situations that you haven't, I haven't let you deal with. And March became mouth month for me, and I don't think it's any different. In April, he's still dealing with me. And then fourthly, spiritual mourning, it's not, it's not condemnation. It's not self-introspection to the point that we condemn ourselves or that we're, we go around beating ourselves up. That's not what God's interested in. That's the devil. Condemnations of the devil. Conviction is the Holy Spirit's ministry and work. And thank God for conviction. But spiritual mourning is filled with hope that sounds like an oxymoron. Well, if I'm broken and I'm mourning and I'm grieving over my, my life's a mess and the way that I've acted towards my spouse or my kids or other people or even towards the Lord, I, I, I'm, term, I'm, I'm in turmoil. I'm not measuring up. And How can that be hopeful? Because that brokenness will lead you to call on the Lord where there is always hope. And that, there's that realization and that reality check that the Holy Spirit wants to give every one of us and those listening, every one of us, the reality check the Holy Spirit wants to give us. Get your hearts right with me. This is the day, the time, the hour, the season that God needs you and I to represent Him in the right way, in a way of living right, holiness, in a way of honoring the Lord, in a way of being fruitful, for the kingdom of God, loving people, walking in love. Listen, be care I have found myself, the more I listen to the news, the more angry I get. And I've had, to, I've had to back off. One evening last week, I said, Sylvia, I can't take it anymore. I can't take any more updates. I can't take any more fighting between the press and the president and the president and the press. I can't take any more. I can't listen anymore. It's making me angry. And I just had to, I said, I'm going to, it was a nice day. It was one of the nice, nicer days of last week. I said, I'm going to ride the bike in the neighborhood and pray and just get my mind off this stuff. And so we did that. And I encourage you, be careful. Be careful of your diet on the news. It will make you angry. No matter what station and media 
format you're listening to, be careful. Make sure that you're praying. Make sure that you're reading the Word. Make sure that God's Word is leading you and guiding you and not the emotion-charged things that we're listening to and subjected to on the news. I listen to it so I know how to pray, but I think I know how to pray now because I, when I read the Bible and look at what's going on in the world, we're in the last days. We're in the last days. So what is this about spiritual mourning? It's filled with hope. Because when you mourn for your sins and you see them for what they really are and the cost that it's costing you, others, and Jesus, really actually you become, you enter into a dangerous place. Because if you don't handle it right, you'll enter into a place of despair, self-condemnation, and that's where the enemy wants you because then you will give up. God didn't call you and I to give up except to give up to Him and give in to Him. But, we have to remember that when God shines His light by the Holy Spirit on our sins, His great purpose is to lead us to Jesus, who is the friend of sinners, whom, in whom we will find hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Hope for forgiveness, hope for mercy, hope for grace, hope for a change, hope for more of Him in our heart and our life and our mind. So don't let yourself fall into deprecation and get focused on your failures and allow bitterness to destroy you or defeat or discouragement. No, 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 that's not where God wants you to go. Hope, hope is the goal of spiritual mourning. And hope arises from faith in Christ and all that He has accomplished for us through the cross. This is tweetable, and you'll find it in the notes. The Holy Spirit never leads a person to despair. He will lead you to examine your heart and repentance, but not despair. The Holy Spirit will lead you to mourn over your sins, but the mourning He leads you into is filled with hope, because there's hope in Jesus of mercy, grace, and a life-transforming experience. The true Christian will understand along with the Apostle Paul and the struggles he had against his own flesh. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul said, I am the foremost or the worst of all sinners. <laughs> Man, if he was in trouble, where does that leave you and me? But then he went on to say in verse 16 of 1 Timothy 1, he said, but with hope we will know. And then he said, but I receive mercy that in me Jesus Christ would display his perfect patience. I don't know about you, but I need the Lord to be patient with me because I don't measure up in myself. And Paul said in Romans 7, 24, Oh, wretched man that I am. But listen, he didn't stop there. The latter part of that verse, he said, But looking to Christ for hope, thanks be to God. And I want you to remember today that His grace and His mercy and to trust in the power of His blood to cleanse us and redeem us. And then fifthly, spiritual mourning, it happens at the cross. And I know many of us here, probably all of us are here, have had that experience at the cross. At least we've had one trip to the cross. I've had several trips to the cross because I've had to go back to the cross several times in my life, not to get born again, but to repent again, to confess my sin again, to ask for mercy and grace again. And it's never, it's never something to be ashamed of. Go back to the cross. That As soon as you sin, be immediate to repent. Don't let it go for a day or two. But mourning happens at the cross. And when we look back again at this definition, spiritual mourning, it's a heartfelt sorrow over particular specific sins. It arises out of humility and it gives hope and it leads us to forsake these sins at the cross. How do you break the power of habitual sin? How do you begin to hate what you shouldn't love and love what you should hate? There's several answers that I've given you in this message. First, Name the specific sin, not in generality. Admit it's your responsibility. It's you. Second, count the cost to yourself, others, and to Christ. You're missing out on something by continuing in your sin. Thirdly, see yourself as empty-handed before God. You're poor in spirit. There's no way you and I can make it without the grace, love, mercy, and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And fourth, realizing that the hope that God gives us will lead us to trust in Christ. That process, it's done humility. And that when it's done in humility, it will lead you and I to the cross. Naming and confessing your sins will lead you into spiritual mourning. It should. But knowing the love of Christ will take you further. Thank you, Lord. There's, hear this. This is important you hear this. Not just with your ears, but with your spirit. There's more to looking at the cross than seeing what your sins did to Jesus. The cross is about what Jesus did for you. When I was a younger Christian, and I'd think about what Jesus did, died, was beat, suffered. It would make me sad. It would make me like, oh God, I'm so sorry. And it would just make me sad. And, you know, I thought that was the right, proper religious response. Be sad what Jesus did. Be sad for him and feel sorry for Jesus and just, oh God. But the, one day the Holy Spirit stopped me and really rebuked me and said, I want you to rejoice in what I did for you. I want you to rejoice that I was loved you enough that I was willing to pay the price for you. Because if I, if I hadn't have done that for you, you would be lost. I want you to rejoice in what I've done for you. Not be sad, not feel sorry for me, but rejoice. Because that's where the hope is. The cross is about what Jesus did for us, not what our sins did to him. At the cross, we will see how much we're loved. That's where we see God's love. It says demonstrated, manifested, revealed in that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Amazing. Not after we cleaned our act up. Not after we stopped doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. While we were yet sinners. While you're out there GDing it. While you're out there cursing. While you're out there fornicating. While you're out there doing everything that's an abomination against God. Jesus Christ and God the Father planned and arranged for your sins to be cleansed away. So that you could know the grace, the love, and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but religion will mess you up. You've heard me say that many times. Religion will make you think that if you observe a certain set of rules and regulations and don'ts, and, and there's more don'ts to do's in religion, but if you'll observe and keep a bunch of those things, you're going to be okay. And you're going you're to have freedom over sin. I found out it wasn't working. I said, God, what's up with this? I'm doing everything the church told me to do. I'm doing everything that, Lord, I, I feel like I'm supposed to do. I'm not doing this. I'm not going there. I'm not partaking of this. I'm not doing this. And, Lord, I don't have any freedom. I don't have any peace. Uh, uh, Lord, I, there's no answer to my prayer. What's wrong? What's up? And I had to realize it's not in our doing, and it's not in our restraints, and it's not in our vows, and it's not in our promises not to do things or to do things. One glimpse. One glimpse touch one experience of christ and the father's love in your heart will change you and strengthen you to do in your battle against sin one touch of his love one encounter with his love changed my heart to the point i said god it's not that I'm trying not to go to hell. No, I don't want to go to hell. But God, I don't want to sin against you because I don't want to break your heart. I don't want to disappoint you. I want to love you, Lord. I want to love you that, Lord, that I'm a faithful son and a faithful child to you, God. And I'll be faithful to you. One touch, one experience, one exposure, one, one, one time in his presence will so change you, radically change you. That you will not want to sin anymore. And you'll so surrender to Him that you will be empowered by His love that will help break that chain and that power of sin off you. The Lord is not calling us to work up repentance in order to offer up our works to Him. He invites us to come to Him so we may find repentance at the cross. And then lastly, spiritual mourning will lead us to forsake our sins. That's the goal. It's not just be forgiven, not just go to heaven. 
I want to live for Him in this life. The, the, the life of eternity, it's going to take care of itself. There won't be any sin there. There'll be no more devil. There'll be no opportunity or chance for somebody to mess up again. I don't know exactly how God's going to arrange that because the devil and the angels, when they were in heaven, they had a choice whether to obey God. The angels today in heaven still have a choice. But somehow God is going to, I guess it's in the change. It says we're going to be changed and we're going to be like Him. When you're like Jesus, you won't want to sin against God. And I don't really totally understand that, to be honest with you. But all I can say is I guess we'll be so enamored, so enraptured, so changed by His love. We won't want to sin ever again throughout all eternity. And there won't be any more problem with it in eternity. What a wonderful place, wonderful place that will be. But the goal is for the Lord to lead us into spiritual mourning and pour in spirit and brokenness so that we'll forsake our sins. The world needs to see a church. No, we're not perfect. We are human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to falter. But thank God we have an advocate with a father. We have a lawyer. We have a representative. His name is Jesus. But the world is looking. The world's looking for a church. The world is looking for the sons and the daughters of God to be manifest in this hour. To show that there is a God in heaven that still is alive, answers prayer, saves, delivers, works miracles. He's still real. I feel, I won't call any names, but I heard this, I heard this second hand. And I won't call any names, but one of our leaders in the nations of a state. They said, well, it, it wasn't prayer. It wasn't faith. It wasn't God that's helped us through COVID-19. It was science. It was medical science. And it was man that came up with answers. First off, it was the Lord. God, God gave man wisdom. God has given this team, regardless of what, and I don't want to get political, God, irregardless of what you think of them, God gave the medical team that's in place trying to help lead this country through a time of, of, of being healed, of, of social distancing right now. We don't like it. We don't enjoy it. But it's working. And God gave them a plan because at first there was not a plan. And even though we've had many, many, too many deaths in America, we've not had the deaths that other nations have seen. Thank the Lord. And some cities that practice the social distancing not like they should have, they haven't had the, the deaths in that city like they have. God gave man the wisdom. God's given man the medical ability and science. God gives us wisdom. God has given us wisdom. But the bottom line is it's the Lord that is helping us through this. But when we talk about spiritual mourning will lead us to forsake our sins. Here's the reality, folks, of it. God has not promised to forgive one sin that you and, our, you and I are not willing to forsake. You don't have to raise your hand or honk your horn or flash your lights or do anything. To, how many times have you prayed, God, take this away from me? I prayed that so many times and nothing ever happened. You know why? God doesn't take anything away from you. God lets you choose. God lets you make a choice. God lets you decide, Lord, I'm tired of living this lifestyle. I'm going to live closer to you. God has not promised to forgive you of one sin that you and I are not willing to forsake. How could we possibly ask God to forgive us if truly in our heart, in our mind, our life, we had no intention of quitting the sin that we just confessed? How could I come to God in confession if in my heart I expected to continue to do the same thing? It was just a matter of time. I want to close with some scriptures today. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, we've used this before. And this is the time. This is the era. This is the moment that you and I are in. It said, seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his or her way and the unrighteous person their thoughts and let them return to the Lord. And here's the good news. The Lord will have compassion on them and to our God for he will abundantly, abundantly pardon. That's what Jesus said in John 10. The thief has come to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And he qualified it even greater. And he said to give you life more abundantly. That means without measure, without limitation. Jesus Christ, God the Father, wants you to live life in him to the fullest. And he is the only resource through which you can have that kind of life. It's not available through the world. 2 Timothy 2.19, Paul said to Timothy, The firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain or to depart, or another translation says, forsake wickedness. 2 Timothy 3, the next chapter, 16 and 17, All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching. For reproof, and here's what I want you to hear this morning. For correction, for correction. The Lord loves, the Lord corrects those whom He loves because He wants them to enjoy His life and His blessings. So Scripture is given by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training. For training in righteousness. That's what you and I are alive for, looking to the coming of the Lord. He is training us in a life of righteousness so we can inherit eternal life, so that the man or woman of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. And then Proverbs 29, 1, the person who hardens his neck, that's where we get that term stiff-necked, the person who hardens his neck after much reproof or after much rebuke or censor or reprimand will suddenly be cut off without remedy. Proverbs 15, 10, there is severe discipline for the person who forsakes God's ways. And the one who hates reproof, who hates to be corrected, who hates to be dealt with, who hates to be called into spiritual mourning, they will die. It's what the Word says. It's not my opinion. It's what God says. You and I cannot ask for forgiveness without serious intent of forsaking the sin and the strength and the grace that God provides us. I want to ask Pastor Larry to come as we close today. That when you feel trapped or enslaved or bound by a habitual or recurring sin in your life, repetitive sin, the way for you out of it, above it, to conquer it is through spiritual mourning. Being poor in spirit, number one, allowing the Holy Spirit to deal with you, that spiritual mourning takes place. Allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you to take the, you to that place and show you, you are in error. You are missing God's will for your life. And to convict you and to work the work of righteousness in you. So that you can be blessed. And that's why it says, that's why Jesus said, Blessed or blessed are those who spiritually mourn, for they will be comforted. Because when you spiritually mourn, He's here. The promise is, is He's there to comfort you. He's there to forgive you with His mercy, with His grace, with His cleansing, with His forgiveness, and with His delivering power that is His promise to you. I want us right all over in this parking lot today, and if you're listening live streaming or maybe you're listening archiving another time, I want you to bow your head with me this morning. I get several emails a day that are devotional emails or prophetic emails and sometimes it's too much to read. And, but this one this morning caught my attention. It's called Small Straws in a Soft Wind by Marsha Burns. And this is what she felt the Holy Spirit was saying right now. This is today. She's saying there's a wave of condemnation sweeping through mankind. It's an attack from the enemy. Did you hear that? Not God. It's an attack from the enemy to establish a sense of failure and self-loathing, hatred. But listen to me, says the Lord. I love and value every human being, and I'm reaching out to you with the truth of your worth, says the Lord. 
Do not believe the lies that will bring discouragement and depression. And then they quote 1 Peter 5.10, But may the, grace of, may the God of all grace, who called us to His eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, that's a spiritual morning, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I believe that's a right on word for today. The devil would like to condemn us. The devil would like to, and, and some people just naturally fall into a self-hatred. They never can get the love of God uh, uh, active in their life. And they're always beating themselves up and they're always allowing Satan. That's not God's will. And I want to tell you today with your heads bowed, that's not God's will for you. If that's you today that you're beating yourself up, that's not what this message is about. That's not my heart. That's not the heart of Jesus in the Beatitudes. But Jesus said, until you and I realize we're poor in spirit, we cannot be righteous before God in ourselves. And until you and I experience and go to that depth of spiritual mourning over our personal sin and even corporately over the sins of our nation, until you and I are willing to let the Lord convict us and deal with us, we cannot be comforted. We cannot have the righteousness that Jesus Christ has for us. Father, today I pray for all of us, including myself. I ask you, we ask you, we thank you. Lord, we don't have to beg you. This is why you came. This is why you sent Jesus. This is why you came in the form of Jesus to give your life on the cross and we can never escape. We can never grow too mature that we don't need the cross or look back to the cross or find the cross an appropriate place in our life daily today. And Lord, I'm not talking about us that have gone back and sinned like we did before Christ. We found Him. But Lord God, the, the sins that we continue to carry and the things that we allow to remain in our heart, that, oh God, we think that our family culture has been this way or we think I'll always be this way because this is the way I've always been. And Father, today, may the Holy Spirit speak to us Lord, you know how to talk to us. You know where every one of us are. You know, O oh Lord, as Psalm 139 says, Search us, O oh Lord, and try us, test us, O oh God, and see if there be any evil or wicked way in us. But you didn't stop there. The cry, the plea, the appeal was, Cleanse us, Lord, from our evil way. Lord, forgive us. And Lord, I thank you that today, because of Jesus, because of your love, Heavenly Father, there's hope there's hope at the cross there's mercy there's grace there's forgiveness there's cleansing there's deliverance and i pray right now lord as people in these cars lord at their home lord some other time hearing it lord on facebook or whenever oh god even in the atmosphere of this neighborhood as the words being projected in the very airways of this atmosphere surrounding this church building that, oh God, that the mercy, the grace, the love of the Father God would penetrate our hearts. That we would know that, Lord, there's deliverance, there's healing, there's forgiveness. That, Lord, there's a setting free in Jesus' name. That whom the Lord sets free, or where the Spirit of the Lord is, that there is liberty. And whom the Lord sets free, there is freedom indeed. And we pray, Father, today as we confess, as we come to you, as we come to the cross as we understand the power of the blood and the name and authority of Jesus, that, Lord, with brokenness, with hu true humility and brokenness, we present ourselves to you, God, individually. And, Father, corporately for our nation, God, our leaders that continually rebel against you, our leaders that continually defy you, Lord, with laws that are being passed, with amendments that are being pushed, Lord, upon the states, upon the citizens, Lord, upon us that are God-fearing people that don't want these things. We don't want abortion. We don't want these things, oh God, that are an abomination. We don't want same-sex marriages. We don't want the transgenderism, Lord, to come into our homes. Or, Lord, we love these people. They're people that you died for. We love them. We, we pray for them, Lord. But, Lord, we don't agree with our leaders, Lord, that are pushing these things upon us, oh God. That they're pushing the Sodom and Gomorrah. They're pushing those days upon us, Lord. We're seeing it increase. And we, Lord, Lord, we know some of these things, they're going to happen because it's last days. 
But Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for mercy. Lord, let your Holy Spirit be poured out without measure again on the United States of America, on Hampton Roads, Lord, on Newport News, on York County, on Gloucester, Lord, on Williamsburg, on Hampton, Lord, on, on uh, Norfolk, Lord, on Virginia Beach, O oh God, on Seaford, on Pocosin, O oh God. God, let your Spirit be poured out in this region, God, upon this state, upon this nation. Lord, let Joel 2, the fulfillment of Joel 2, that you pour the Holy Spirit out upon all mankind, O oh God. We realize there's a rise of evil like we've never seen before. But Father, we stand in the rise of righteousness and holiness and the move of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen before. Revival, third great awakening. Folks swept into the kingdom of God, saved and born again and set free and delivered. Lord, that's the kingdom we stand for today. And we ask for your blessing. We ask for your mercy. We ask for the cleansing power of the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let there not be condemnation in any way today, God, taken. Let there be the hope of the gospel, the hope of the love of the Father, be received by every heart today. Lord, for your glory, in Jesus' name, Yeshua's name, we pray it. Amen and amen. Your father again uh, we're going to offer this this is a little bit different today again as you leave they'll receive your offering at either of the three exits if you want prayer we're asking you if you say, pastor I want to stay for prayer we'll come to your car several of us will come to your car so if you want to if you want to stay for prayer you need prayer stay here after everybody else is gone turn your emergency flashers on so we can see that and uh, crack your window so we can communicate with you. Actually, we can be here with our windows down. So if you can take the cold, I'm cold up here, but the sun is starting to shine a little bit. We want to just offer that dimension today that we'll stay and some will come to your car and pray. Be patient because I don't know how many of our prayer team is here. Actually, this morning, this is something new. We didn't actually get a chance to tell them, share them with that. But we want to offer that for you. If you want prayer, just stay here. Turn your flashers on and somebody from the prayer team will get to you. We meet at 10 o'clock next Sunday. Everybody got it? 10 a.m.? Again, Wednesday night, we're live streaming from the sanctuary, live worship, live word, 715. We'll be bringing to you different teachings through the week. Sylvia and I will continue to communicate with you daily. Thank you, Pastor JR. Thank you for Jeff South. Thank you for Pastor Larry. Thank you for Josiah. Waldron and JR and, and all the others that are helping us make this happen. Our ushers, let's give them a, we can't get, give them a hand and honk your horn, flash your lights. <laughs> Amen. We love you. Most important, Jesus loves you. Have a blessed, spirit filled week. Don't forget to tell somebody about God's love today, this week. Amen. God bless. We love you.